Welcome to another attempt at filling out the application. In other words, expanding our ability to apply the words of Scripture to our lives. I'm your host, Larry, and today we will be looking at Acts chapter 4. So after the night in jail that followed Peter and John, healing a lame man in Jesus' name, and of course giving the sermon to the crowd this miracle had created around them, they were asked by the authorities to identify by whose power or in whose name they had healed. I kind of like how Peter opens with what to me could only be a little bit of sarcasm. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, he then of course lays out for them the gospel narrative of Jesus, who was crucified and raised from the dead, concluding with the proclamation, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. Though Peter moves to a clear gospel message, that opening little bit of sarcasm seems to be a little bit of shaming concerning their lack of compassion. That first phrase seems to reflect that Peter truly is a disciple of his master, as among the few occasions that we are told that Jesus actually got angry was the time in Mark chapter 3, verse 5, that the religious leaders had no concern for human suffering when the opportunity for a healing occurred on the Sabbath. Jesus asked them if it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath, and they wouldn't even answer with the hurting man standing right in front of them. Mark tells us that Jesus looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Instead of celebrating the miraculous way in which someone's suffering had ended, the leaders went out and started plotting to murder Jesus. The Lord wasn't simply angry. It hurt him that they didn't have any more compassion in their hearts than this. This chapter of Acts moves past the trial and ends with the reassurance that the apostles have not been dissuaded from testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 33 has the beginning of this sentence, though. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. Luke goes on to tell us that people would sell their property when necessary to help take care of those who were in need. While Peter had challenged their being called to defend a miraculous act of kindness, it was kindness made possible by the grace of God that had come to define this early fellowship of believers. The lack of kindness in human hearts that angered and distressed Jesus had been healed by the power of grace at work among them. It's a wonderful example that grace isn't just about forgiveness, but transformation. The human temptation towards selfishness and a lack of compassion was overcome by the grace that Jesus died to bring. He was distressed by the hardness of heart he found, but Jesus died and now lives to send his spirit that it might be changed into the sacrificial kindness that defines his disciples. Let's hope to grow in our response to grace so that we will be people who are defined by acts of kindness rather than being like those who can't understand or accept such radical expressions of God's love. After all, Jesus told us that he would honor our expressions of kindness that are motivated by his love, even if they were so small as just sharing a drink of water with someone who was thirsty. To shamelessly rip off an old saying, a thousand acts of kindness may begin with a drink of water. That's it for this week. Let's take what we've learned today to go be active disciples who don't just read the word, but live out the word.